So Greg, during the 2008 anti-terrorism trial, when you acted as a defence barrister for Izzat Rad, you asked, how can criminal law criminalise thought and word? Further, you said, and I quote, what this case has shown us is that law that governs terrorists in this country are radically wrong. It can be the Islamic community today that is under threat, but these laws can be used and turned on environmental groups, on unions, any group in the community that is giving a lot of trouble to the government. It is unquestionable that there will be, because of the breathtaking injustices in this case, a day of reckoning. It may not be today or tomorrow, but the day will come. So there continues to be what was previously an unconscionable grab at our civil liberties and all held under the rubric of the national security state. So through WikiLeaks, we're now facing down attacks on freedom of the press, rights to access to information, whistleblower protections and internet freedoms. And through the Occupy movement, we see an attack on freedom of speech, political protest and right to assemble. So Greg, I want to know why you think this is all happening and are we near this day of reckoning? Well, I think it's happening for a number of reasons. I think firstly, in relation to terrorism, it was brought on by uh, an irrational uh, legislative reaction to 9-11, uh, bad policy made in the heat of the moment. In relation to Julian Assange and uh, various other, uh, the Occupy movement, I think that the state, uh, having shrunk in size in the 1970s, is now back with a vengeance. Uh, but not uh, the beneficial state, the state in the sense of controlling our lives. Uh, and whether it be uh, the Occupy movement, or whether it be in the form, I would argue, even of uh, some of the anti-smoking laws, we are seeing an encroachment by the state into the lives of ordinary people uh, in a way that we had in the 1950s and we liberalised in the 1960s and 70s, but it's back. Mm. Well, it kind of skips me to the last thing I want to discuss with you, but I, I read a review that you wrote on Chris Hedges' uh, The Death of the Liberal Class, and which I think is a wonderful book. One of the criticisms you made about that book was, where was the solution to the disintegration of the effect of that class? Uh, and I'm not at the end of the book yet, and, and I, th I think you claimed that there was some construct that was offered. But it, it did make me think about you talking about deliberative democracy when you're involved in the um, campaign for to make Australia a republic, and which is kind of an exchangeable um, uh, concept for participatory democracy, which Occupy movement have adopted, but was really burst in clarity in the early 60s with the Port Her Heron statement. Uh, so how are you feeling about that about that model and do you feel it's still, I mean I know you thought it was critical in terms of uh, of getting real grassroots engagement with a big decision for the community, but how do you see it as a more kind of systemic part of, of democracy? Well I think the beauty of deliberative democracy is that it's informed, you get informed debates. So I think the great uh, problem of modern democracy is that it's, uh, and we hear this all the time, that it's spin driven, it's driven by slogans, it's driven by reductionist thinking that you get in the Herald Sun and the Daily Telegraph every day of the week where it's a them and us mentality on the front page. Uh, and when it comes to issues, whether it be climate change, whether it be drugs, uh, you get scare campaigns run by either side of the debate and you're getting very little by way of informed debate. Ironically, we're better educated now, more people you know, going to university now than we've ever had, and yet we've got this dumbing down. Uh, and I think that the, 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 the issue though is uh, how do uh, genuine liberals, as opposed to conservatives, and I would class myself as a genuine liberal, uh, re-engage uh, with the community. And I think that only comes about uh, if you do have a more, a, a greater uh, concept of deliberative democracy. Now, 
deliberative democracy is very co common in the United States, it's very common in Canada. We don't use it in this country. Uh, and we ought to use it because you do get more informed decision making. You'd be surprised in the United States, for example, how many local decisions are made after deliberative democracy processes take place. We hear about the bad ones that are made, but there are some very good decisions made by communities after deliberative democracy processes. More broadly, though, I think our politicians have let us down. They've let us down because they don't present a vision. The last time we had a vision in this country was in 1993 when it was Keating versus Houston. Since then, all we've had in Australia is essentially uh, slogan-driven campaigns, fear-driven campaigns, negative campaigns. And we see on the horizon, that's what you see coming up. Uh, you know, you look at the Labor Party today, it's driven by machine people. Uh, you look at the Liberal Party, uh, it's driven by this uh, uh, attachment to the hard right. Uh, and uh, in the middle, there's this huge gap uh, which could be occupied uh, by the Malcolm Turnbulls of the world and others like myself who are genuinely liberal. But I don't think that we've prosecuted our case effectively and that's why the extremes have taken over and that's why uh, you do get the them and us mentality in political debate today. Okay, but we do see the left-right paradigm or binary paradigm dissolve around um, issues that are important to US foreign policy. And so my feeling as an Australian citizen is that it's impossible for me uh, to vote um, to get my government to support a position against US foreign policy and that I have to activate um, outside of the typical political model. So, and we see that taking place here in relation to the response to Julian Assange and the attitude towards WikiLeaks. We saw it Monday night on Q&A uh, where these parties are standing together and singing from that same chorus book. So Christine Assange did an interview on Radio Australia yesterday. She was very irate um, at the discourse on Q&A. Um, mostly from Nicola Roxon. So I just want to talk to you about uh, one point, and Christine had 18, but one of the major focuses was around um, Nicola representing the amendment to the Extradition Act that took place in February uh, 2012. And so the question was put that uh, would, this, would this act or this new amendment affect um, the opportunity for the Australian government to e extradite Julian Assange if he were to return home. So there was a lot of dispute around that. Um, Christine certainly is claiming, and we've read from the Monash Castan Centre, etc., analysis of the amendments, and it seems to most definitely um, lower the standard of consideration in terms of attaching them to regulation as opposed to legislation and then to hand over the uh, discretionary decision making to the executive which are clearly politically aligned to the to the geopolitical superpower so what's your understanding of this amendment and how do you feel about it in relation to wikileaks i, I think the, the caston center's analysis is right i think there's uh, and, and anyone who argues to the contrary i think is fooling themselves uh, this amendment uh, was done for the purpose of ensuring that politically troublesome citizens of Australia can be dealt with in a way that is expeditious uh, for those in authority. Uh, handing uh, power to the executive uh, and the utilisation of ministerial discretion is something that we've seen creep into Australian lawmaking in the last 10 years through the Migration Act, uh, anti-terrorism laws. We're now seeing it in the, the Barkey laws where ministers and police commissioners have got discretion to prescribe organisations and individuals. And the reason they're doing this is because it's, uh, it's uh, less amenable to appeal. You've got to find an error of law, or you've got to find unreasonableness on the part of the decision maker. It's less amenable. Uh, and they do that to screw people. Uh, bluntly, that's what they do. They, it, whether, it, whether it's a bikey or whether it's a person associating with bikies or whether it's Julian Assange or whether it's an asylum seeker, they're there to be screwed uh, because they're inconvenient. Uh, and um, they're politically inconvenient. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind that that's what this means. Let me come back to your point, though, about the US. Uh, it, what I think has been staggering in the Assange case, and sad, is the umbilical, umbilical attachment of Julia Gillard and the Labor Party and the Coalition to the United States. It is just sad to watch. Uh, I know of no other country in the world, except perhaps the UK, 
uh, which is so slavishly sycophantic to the United States, an empire in decline, uh, an empire whose best days are behind it, when you've got a rising power in China, and all we see China as is a bank, a two-way bank, uh, and you've got Julia Gillard who then whacks troops up into Darwin, you know, a slap in the face for Beijing and she thinks she can get away with it. Australia can't keep playing this game. And what she's done with the Assange case, I think, is showing that at the end of the day, Australian political leaders have never had the courage of a David Longy or a Helen Clark in New Zealand to strike out with an independent foreign policy. They're too scared to. And political journalists often say, oh, Australians like the US alliance. I'm not so sure about that, particularly in the face of the next generation of Australians who will live with China as the superpower, not the United States. Mm. Well, staying in the United States for a minute, I just want to draw you out on your understanding of the National Defence Authorisation Act and what is being termed as, you know, the most unparalleled executive powers. How do you feel about that as, as an officer of the law and what, what do you see are the potential effects in the WikiLeaks case in relation to that? Well, the United States uh uh, legislation in relation to national security uh, provides uh, almost uh, unparalleled, in fact un it does provide unparalleled power to a leader of a democratic country. That is to be able to effectively uh, run a legal process from start to finish on his or her own terms to deny Defence Council documents, to deny them access to their clients, uh, to ensure that uh, any trial is a kangaroo court, that it's uh, to allow for uh, cruel and unusual punishment in the form of uh, solitary confinement for torture. Uh, these are uh, matters of fact. Uh, if you look at the executive powers used by President Bush in relation to Guantanamo Bay, we saw this happening before our very eyes. If you look at it in relation to Bradley Manning, we're seeing it in front of our very eyes. Make no mistake, when the, the Swedes, who are completely gutless on this issue, shop Mr Assange to the United States, which they will do, uh, Julian Assange would be subjected to uh, cruel and unusual punishment, uh, torture. Uh, he would then be, uh, if you thought David Hicks was badly treated, um, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, the political pressure in the United States will be to treat Assange in the most appalling fashion and Australia, as usual, sit on its hands and do nothing until the screams become so loud uh, that, as we saw in relation to uh, Hicks, there'll be a grubby political deal cut, in that case between Cheney and Howard, uh, in order to get uh, Assange home. But only after he's been through psychological and physical uh, torture of a type which uh, is intolerable under any circumstances in any society. So, Greg, what would you like to see your Australian community do about that? And, and what are the legal fraternity going to do in this atmosphere? Well, I'll say a couple of things about that. Firstly, the, the, uh, legal, an independent legal profession in a democracy is an essential tool because it is the only check on a rampant executive. It is a bulwark for the individual against the executive. And we saw that in the Mohammed Hanif case. Uh, we've seen it in a range of cases around Australia where unfashionable causes have been taken up by lawyers. Uh, to uh, undermine uh, the rights of lawyers in these cases in the way that is done in the anti-terror law cases uh, and in the United States, uh, and to prohibit judges uh, from doing their job, which is also to be a check on the executive, um, is something that is uh, undermining of the fabric of democracy and yet it is being done in these cases. In a sense what I'm saying is it is it is difficult for lawyers to affect change in the Assange case given uh, and, and in the anti-terror cases given the construct of the legislation. Uh, so what needs to happen is you need to have brave lawyers like Jennifer Robertson or Stephen Kime in the Hanif case, uh, lawyers who are prepared to stand up now, lawyers who are prepared to take risks, now I should say in relation to Ms Robinson, uh, to hold her at an airport uh, and to say you are on some form of prohibited list is something that I've not heard of uh, in my years in practice and in my roaming around the globe talking to lawyers. But it's not dissimilar to what happened to Stephen Kime, who was Hanif's barrister and who gave to the Australian 
uh, transcripts of Mohammed Hanif's interview, exculpatory interviews, to the federal police. Uh, he was then brought up before the Queensland Law Society Ethics Committee uh, by a lawyer in the state who happened to have political connections in the National Party. So if you put your head up, uh, you can expect as a lawyer to have someone try and chop it off. And uh, it's the bravery of people like Kyme and Robinson that I think should act as a spur to others to get involved in these issues and to make a lot of noise about them. So are you spurred on, Greg? Well, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, my involvement in the Assange case has been minimal to date, but I've certainly participated with Lizzie O'Shea and Rob Starry and others in meetings and conferences about Julian Assange. Uh, and I think that any lawyer uh, who takes uh, his or her oath seriously uh, would stand unambiguously in favour of Assange. Uh, because not to do so is to say uh, a rampant executive is okay, we give it a green light, uh, and we allow people, whatever crime they may or may not have committed, or be alleged to have committed, we allow them to be slaughtered uh, um, at, the, at the altar of, um, uh, of political expediency. And once you let that happen, uh, you may as well do away with your legal system, because uh, it's worthless. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you.